The fighting in the Ypres salient in 1917 is often remembered as a muddy, bloody failure. The horrific struggle in the mud of Passchendaele gives the impression that the entire campaign achieved little but death and despair. But in reality, the Third Battle of Ypres began with a series of stunning Allied victories, which pushed the Germans back and suggested that the way to win the First World War had finally been discovered. In September 1917, at a small wood not far from Passchendaele, Australian troops achieved one of their greatest victories of the war. Today, the wood is a place of pilgrimage and reflection, not just for Australians, but for British, Canadians and New Zealanders who come here to remember their fallen sons. This is Polygon Wood. This is Polygon Wood Cemetery, Simon, and I've always liked it because it's a genuine battlefield cemetery and you don't see mm. too many of those in this area of the Ypres yep. salient. So you can see the layout of the graves in all directions, many of them close together. Yeah. It indicates that these men were buried under fire. This cemetery was here during the war. This was where men would bury their dead comrades. Uh, and they True. do so under fire during the war. And you can see that, that's reflected. As we, as we say, you don't risk the lives of the living to take care of the dead. And so these men would be sent out after dark to bury their comrades very, very quickly. It's just a, it's a, it's a fascinating place to stand, isn't it? It is, it is. And uh, most of these places were amalgamated later on, but uh, they've kept this one and they've linked it to the one next to it in the cemetery even. So, and you can see an awful lot of these men, you know, we don't know these days even who is buried here sometimes. Names have been lost in time. But um, they are very well looked after, and that's the main thing. They are here, they are remembered by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Interestingly, most of the graves in this cemetery are New Zealanders, because this was in early 1918, this was a New Zealand sector. And so yeah. the Kiwis pop up again uh, for dominating this area. The area of Polygon Wood behind us yeah. is known for British occupation, for the Australians capturing it yeah, yeah, in yeah. September 1917. But the cemetery yeah. is, for the most part, a, a tribute to New Zealand. Again, yeah, yeah. the multi multinational effort to overthrow the We even the had Canadians in here in 1915 and everyone came through the wood, the French as well. Lots of Kiwis here and we even have some New Zealand bunkers in the wood still. Uh, and we, yeah, they had a devastating time here in December 1917, right after Passchendaele having to go through all of this again. The attack on Polderhoek Chateau was, a, was an absolute disaster as well. So this is where we find them, the Kiwis. Um, this is where they, like you said, were buried by their comrades uh, during the battle, you know, yeah. We've been to other cemeteries where it's busy. There's buses pulling in and people getting out and tour groups turning yes. up. This one we've got all to ourselves. Is this a place that people, is this less visited than other cemeteries in the area? It is, it is. So we have about 160, 70 cemeteries in the local area. And with all respect, when people come and visit, they tend to go to all the same ones. And this one hardly ever gets a visit. And they all deserve a visit. Imagine if you'd been here for 100 years, you'd want someone to come up and say hello. And that's what it's about for me, you know. So I'm, I'm really glad we get to come here today and, and look at all these graves from so many different countries of the world, you know. It tells an interesting story, but there's actually a much bigger story that, that has been hidden away. And if we come over here, I find this fascinating. Ignore the new gate, that's a relatively new addition, of course. But these are this is different brickwork here on both sides, and that indicates there was once an opening here. Yes. And it led to? A German cemetery. A German cemetery. Linked to this one, yes. And so it, it tells that story of the post Second World War era when the Belgian people decided there were too many German graves and graves like the in cemeteries like this one were closed and their bodies concentrated in places like Langemark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's an interesting but very complicated story. So it was done in conjunction and agreement with the German War Graves Commission because uh, someone had to pay for the maintenance. And Germany wasn't a very wealthy country after the First World War, so it was decided uh, by all parties involved that uh, the Germans, a forward-looking nation, would invest in the future of their country rather than the maintenance that of 170 cemeteries as the Commonwealth does, still does today. So that's why we only have four large German cemeteries in the area. Most of the German burials were concentrated at Langemark and other cemeteries. 
Yes. It's fascinating when you look at this area, when you see wartime photographs looking through here, you do see a cemetery here. You see yep. a cemetery marked on trench maps, but it's the German cemetery. It's not this one, which was formed later after the fighting here. And there's actually a famous photo showing troops yes. coming through here, walking towards yes, yes. Polygon Wood, and they're actually walking through the German yeah, cemetery. Yeah. There was a German burial ground here long before the Brits arrived. Uh, there's this very famous photograph with the, with the cross, as you say. Yes, yes. And uh, interestingly enough, there's one German burial left on this cemetery. A German who died in 1918. By that stage, his German cemetery would have been destroyed by shell fire. He died and he's buried, he still lies today here on this one, amongst the Brits, the Kiwis, uh, uh, amongst his former enemies. But in, you know, that, that's the beauty of remembrance, you know. Uh, they all died for the same cause, in a way, uh, different sides of the line, but they remembered together. That's, uh, that's poignant. So the fifth Australian Divisional Memorial, Simon, the only one of the five Australian memorials to be placed in Belgium. And it's got quite a location up here overlooking the cemetery, doesn't it? It does, it does. It's on top of the butt. The old, uh, you know, target that the Belgian army put down here long before the war. They used it as target practice. This was kind of considered as well a training ground for the Belgian military. Later on, the Germans fortified it. They put all sorts of uh, tunnels inside it, you know, to, to keep safe. And when the Aussies conquered it, it was, well, it was very much a big landmark, you know. And uh, obviously, still today, it still dominates the forest. You can see the memorial from miles away as you walk through the woods to uh, reach the cemetery and then the memorial itself. So it is a very poignant place, you know. It was, uh, was, the, was the target for the battalions that morning. and. They took it, yeah. Well, what I love about this memorial is like the other memorials, the Australian Divisional Memorials, it talks about how it is in honour of the men who fought and died in an area that they considered to be the most significant spot for their division. And this here at Polygon Wood, this is an Australian battlefield. It was the fifth division that mostly fought here. And to them, this is the place where their memorial most belonged. And I can see why they came through here. There was no wood here. There was just a sea of shattered stumps and they came through and over, overcame the Germans up here on the, on the butt. And this is just a really appropriate place. And when we look at the battle honours up here, there's yeah. some of the most significant names yeah. in the military history of Australia in the First World War. But very unusually, Fromel, the first battle honour up there, yes. Fromel. You, I tell you what, the disastrous battle of Fromel, the most costly 24 hours in Australian military history, you don't often see that as a battle honour on too many memorials. No, 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 but well, st still they died there and, um, you know, they fought there, they died there and they are remembered, you know, and uh, it, it's good to have uh, so many, so many places, you know, mentioned here. It's quite interesting. I'm uh, just looking for Mel, Bapaum, Bullecourt, the third Battle of Ypres, where we are now, Polygon Wood, which is the location we're now standing, Brood Scene, the Battle yeah. of Armion, Villers Bretno, yeah. 8th of August, all the way up to Peron and the Hindenburg Line late in 1918. Yeah, so yeah. the 5th Division really earned their stripes in the yeah. First World War, imagine some of the most you, yeah. imagine significant you live, sites. If you lived through all that, <laughs> you'd, you'd feel entitled to come here and stand in front of yes. your memorial yes. and remember everything you've been through. It's interesting too, because this one, like four of the five, is the same exact same design, the, the yes. obelisk with the, the Australian cap badge on it and the battle honours. Yeah. The only exception is the second division memorial down at Mont Saint Quentin in mm. France, which shows an Australian soldier, yes. uh, a, a sculpture of an Australian soldier. So I, I, I love this monument. I love its simplicity. I love what it says. I love the message it gives. And most of all, I love the location here, looking out over this sea of graves, the comrades yeah, and the yeah, men of the fifth yeah. division who fell in and around this area. And it looks out not just over the cemetery, it looks out over the forest and the fields where so many of the Australians still lie today, you know. It is a poignant place from on top of this memorial. You could see the whole place where they fought and where they lie still today. So it is a very poignant place. And, and still today, the Belgians use it uh, as their gathering point on Anzac Day. This is where we all gather for the dawn service. And um, you can line up the buglers and the riflemen on top of the butt. And it is uh, very poignant as the sun rises over the hill. We all stand in the darkness on the other side and when the sun rises, you hear the bugles calling out and it is, uh, 
uh, it's incredible emotional. It's very special. And it's always a privilege if you can attend, I think. Yes. This is a concentration cemetery, Simon, and graves were brought in from the battlefields all around here. And there's a number of big cemeteries like this in the area, aren't there, that contain mm. bodies from the whole range of battles that occurred in and around these fields. And there was a lot, there was a lot of battles, weren't there? Certainly were. And uh, still the work continues today. You know, they, whenever we find soldiers, they're still concentrated on these same cemeteries. And still today you see so many of them don't have a name on their grave, which is a real tragedy for them and, and their families, you know, who are still often looking for them. So um, sometimes you get lucky, you know, and one is still identified these days. And, uh, but if you look at the ages of some of these people uh, and the careers they had, uh, they are awfully young, you know, 27 year old Lieutenant Colonel. Every time I'm in this cemetery, Simon, I come and stand in front of the grave of Lieutenant Colonel Humphrey Scott, DSO, mm. because in so many ways he symbolises the, what the young men of the First World War achieved. So an Australian, he was a Gallipoli man, he fought at Gallipoli, he enlisted soon after the start of the war, fought his way through, was promoted through the ranks, and by the age of 27 was commanding an entire battalion. It's, it's quite incredible. He was a Lieutenant Colonel, he'd been awarded the Distinguished Service Order, yes. the second highest yes. medal yes. for officers under the Victoria Cross. and just one of those amazing stories, a boy colonel, yes. like so many of them were at the age of 27. I don't, I don't know what you were doing at the age of 27, <laughs> but I certainly wasn't, uh, I certainly wasn't leading a thousand men no, in combat. No, no, yes. But um, tragically, he was killed standing up on the butt after this area had been captured, and he and the British officer he was handing over yes, to yes. were both killed, and there's, there's reports vary as to what killed them. Some say it was a sniper, sniper firing yeah. at long range. Mm. Other people say that it was just a spent round that had come out of the distance and, and killed them both. Uh, and I even heard one report that a round bounced off a helmet that had been discarded and was lying next to them on the ground. Mm. But either way, it was unlucky and both commanding officers were killed yes. on that spot and buried. What are the odds, again, of that happening? Just, it, it, you know, some, some of these stories are huge, some of them are, are tiny, but of course they mean everything for the men involved. That's it, yeah. And just one story, one, you know, we're surrounded by thousands of graves, yes, more than 2,000 such stories. One, yes, every single headstone has a story to tell and uh, every name on a memorial to the missing has a story to tell. Until we've done all of those, you've never, you're never finished, let's say, you know, you can spend hours and hours at these places and still not knowing all the details. Indeed you should. Mm. I, I say this to people all the time that when you come to a military cemetery, just spend some time wandering and reading the names and the ages and the inscriptions from the family. I think it's interesting here that Lieutenant Colonel Scott is flanked by an unknown British soldier and an unknown New Zealand soldier. So we've got a little, a little demonstration here, just in this row, oh, yes. of the combined effort required to capture this ground from the Germans. I haven't been back here for quite a while, Simon. It's been several years since I've been back here, but whenever I'm in this cemetery, I like to come up here and visit a handful of graves that are very special, well very special everyone, but also very special to me because this is the the five Australian bodies that were uncovered under the road and even though I wasn't involved in any of the good work of the identification, I was involved in telling their story in a documentary yes, yes, called Lost were. in Flanders many years ago. So it's wonderful that they've been identified and using DNA for the first time. Yes, we're talking, we're yes. talking nearly 15 years ago <laughs> now that they were identified and it's it's quite remarkable, isn't it? So yeah, we've got yeah. Uh, Sergeant Calder, Private Hunter, Private Story, and just just a fascinating chapter of military history that they found, well not just military history, but Australian and Belgian history, found them under a road, DNA tested them and were able to tell their families that they, after 90 years, they uncovered their lost relative. Yeah, but that, I know it means so much to families, but also by doing that, by spending that money on the research, Australia Really, really led the way, you know, to uh, other Commonwealth nations who now do the same and who will now DNA test their missing ones. You know, you've really paved the way for a lot of other countries to follow in your footsteps and and do the same with their uh, missing soldiers that are being brought in from the cold. And by doing that, we can uh, put so many families at rest. You know, so many worries, so many unanswered questions. And uh, I've been here, I've attended many, many funerals here over the years and uh, it means so much to the families. 
you know, it must cost a lot, but still it is, it is worth it if you can bring them in. It's a controversial subject because at places like Fromel, for example, mm. down in France, they found 250 bodies. Yes. And it was a big debate over whether they should spend the money on DNA testing soldiers who'd been dead for, yes, yes. for nearly a century. And, it, you know, it, it, it does have an effect for families. Families do feel a sense of closure, to use that overused word, yes, yes. when they can identify their lost relative. I remember a case from New Zealand many years ago where New Zealand decided not to, and they had a reason as well. They said, we will ask DNA from so many families, and in the end, we'll possibly make one family happy and we'll end up disappointing so many others there's something to be said for that as well and uh, well it's a key yeah. point especially in the cemetery as we look around us everywhere we just see unknown graves unknown graves and when i bring people to cemeteries like these they say maybe i should put my dna forward in case that's my great uncle or my great grandfather lying in that grave but of course they'll never dna no. test bodies that are in cemeteries already so that soldier and the hundreds behind him will remain unknown forever. There's a, a key feature with the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, let them rest in peace. So indeed they won't dig them up, but if they can prove through research alone who is underneath an unknown headstone, they will change the stone, they will re officially rededicate it, the regiment will come over with the family. And that happens again at an increasing rate the last few years, but you are right in saying that most of them will never get the name. Well, it's remarkable we can stand here in this row and it's a, it's a testament to the soldiers that are still being found after all this time and the lengths we're going to to identify them. So I think it's a, it's a very special place yeah. on the battlefields to stand. I used to wonder, Simon, what they did. It's a macabre topic, but with body parts, parts of bodies that you'd find on the battlefield, which are a unfortunately all too common discovery and for years there was nothing you could do with them because you couldn't take them to the Commonwealth War Graves and they, they wouldn't bury just isolated bone fragments so there was nothing you could do except cover them over back in the fields where you found them but there's been a change in philosophy which I think is really interesting and this headstone here this very special marker records that it doesn't say specifically but this is a marker to indicate where they're burying fragmentary remains of soldiers that you find on the battlefield and I, I think it's a really good thing I think as it, more and more expansion occurs, more building work occurs, we are turning over more small fragments of bones and things. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing now that there, there's a place for them to lie. Yes. What do you think is a local though? Because it's easy for me to say this from Australia, you're dealing with this every day. I, I think I'm not just any local boy. I, I mean, you know, I, I have a deep interest in all of this. Not, again, not everyone has that. Um, so what happens when we found uh, remains? These days it's done a lot more by the book than it used to be. Uh, so the police gets involved and eventually the remains are handed over to the Belgian military who look after them uh, for quite a while uh, and then hand them over to the right authorities, you know, for reburial. Uh, but if they usually do not, can, if they can't establish a nationality, at least here in Belgium, very often the remains will end up on a Belgian cemetery uh, or in this case even on a, on a Commonwealth cemetery uh, where they are added as well. But uh, sadly... Uh, due to time and the brutality of war uh, only body parts are left sometimes we've seen the name simon of literally hundreds of missing soldiers in the cemetery behind us yes it's quite poignant but we've got to remember that these men are remembered they're not they're not completely unknown they're remembered on memorials all over the battlefields and most famously the menin gate or tietval yes. down in the somme but here's a much smaller one, but I think no less poignant in its own way. In fact, I think it's more touching because it is a memorial to the missing, but with only a small number of names on it. It's a New Zealand memorial. Yes, yes, I have a soft spot for the Kiwis. So the New Zealanders decided to remember their missing on the battlefields where they went missing, rather than put their names on the larger memorials, you know, like Menin Gate in the town centre of Ypres. Uh, they remember them where they are. Physically, the Kiwis had a very rough time here trying to take Polderhoek Chateau on the other side of the wood in the winter of 1718. Uh, and um, so a lot of the names of the people on this memorial are either, you know, linked to a grave, an unknown grave on the cemetery or linked to someone who's still out there in the woods. And I think it's very poignant that the Kiwis remember them 
Very day on. It's a beautiful place. I think it's lovely. I mean, not only is it a beautiful building, but you're right. We've got these tablets of names, several hundred names. Those men, most of those men, would be in the cemetery, only, mm. only metres away from where they're falling, or still out in the fields. Mm. But regardless, they're probably within view yes. of the memorial yes. where they're commemorated. It's, it's very touching. It must have been when families came here in the 1920s as pilgrims, it must have been incredibly touching to know that they were standing very close mm. to where their son or brother was. It, was, it is, it is. And I've taken family members here to see a name on the wall. And uh, the main thing is always that uh, they are remembered. They are not missing, as Plumer said. They are here. This is where we remember them. This is where we have our Anzac Day dawn service as well. So uh, they're looked after, and that's the main thing, yes. Do you think it will continue in the future? Will we continue to remember them another 100 years from now? So yes, the main thing is they are remembered. Their names are here on the memorial family. Come and see them. And the local people have really picked up that torch of remembrance over the years. They've done lots of ceremonies, events. We carry it on from one generation to another. So they are remembered. And I'm sure by the local people here in Belgium, they will be remembered forevermore.